Good evening and welcome to Friday evening of Sedona Wolf Week. I think this is the evening that I'm the most excited about and I'm incredibly honored to be introducing the gentleman I'm about to introduce. But I think that Doug Smith, the head wolf biologist and Rick's good friend from Yellowstone says it the best in the afterwards of Rick's book, The Rise of Wolf 8. And I'm gonna quote that. I'm actually gonna read it so I do it justice. No one has spent more time observing wolves in the wild than Rick McIntyre, no one. Take a moment to think about this. The person who wrote the book you have in your hands has dedicated more hours, days, and years to documenting the lives of wolves than anyone who has ever lived. More hours, days, and years than anyone who has ever lived. Rick is an incredible observer. He's diligent with his notes. He knows everything about these packs. And he's able to understand them because he spends so much time with them. But Rick is also an incredible storyteller, an incredible presenter. And the stories of the Druid Pack 21 and 42 are almost Shakespearean. And Rick is able to convey their stories in a way that no one can. I spent the last year or so talking to Rick on the phone. And we don't just talk about wolves, which is really exciting when you're talking to Rick McIntyre, but we talk about presenting. We talk about magic. We talk about performance. And Rick has the ability to take those observations and take that storytelling and make it into the most exciting, compelling story that you've ever read. He'll make you laugh. He'll make you cry. He'll make you smile. I guarantee it. And so Rick is about to tell those stories from his own backyard in Montana. And then we're going to come back for a live Q&A. So it's my honor to introduce Rick McIntyre. Enjoy. We'll see you soon. Hello, my name is Rick McIntyre, and uh, welcome to my portion of the Sedona Wolf Week Conference. We're going to be talking about the two books that I've written about the Yellowstone Wolves here. The first one that came out last year was The Rise of Wolf 8, and then in late September, it uh, will be The Reign of Wolf 21. We'll talk about both of those very accomplished males. I started in Yellowstone in 1994. That was the year before the reintroduction in 1995. And I would think that many of you are, are somewhat familiar with that famous story. Three wolf packs were brought down from Alberta. We're going to be talking about two of them. One was known as the Rose Creek Pack and the other the Crystal Creek Pack. The main character in my first book, Wolf 8, was a pup in the Crystal Creek family. There were four male pups brought down with the two parents, and he was the runt of the litter. He was the little guy. In the acclimation pen where he and his family lived for two months, he was picked on and bullied and beaten up by his bigger brothers a lot. But when he and the others were released two and a half months later, his life got a lot better just because there were more things to do. Now, the other pack that I've already mentioned was the Rose Creek pack. That was alpha female number nine, her daughter, a pup, number seven. In Alberta, her mate, the father of the pup, had been killed either by hunters or trappers. So the Park Service put in their acclamation pen an unrelated male, number 10, in hopes that they would pair off and get along. And that's exactly what happened. In fact, by the time she was released in March, she was pregnant. Now, after they were released, for some reason, that family started to move east. At a certain point, the very young daughter, who wasn't, uh, well, it was maybe roughly a year old at that point, decided that she was going to set off on her own. She found a mate and established the first naturally forming pack in Yellowstone during the reintroduction period, but we'll continue on with the older wolves. So pregnant number nine and her new mate number 10, they traveled east, and they apparently didn't realize it, but they passed over the national park border. 
meaning they were going in an area that was somewhat hostile to having wolves there. And on the very day that she gave birth to eight pups, a very large litter, number 10 was illegally shot and killed. The guy was caught, he was convicted, he spent time in prison. But the real story was the tough time that that mother wolf was about to have the day that he was shot. So she was a single mother, she had eight pups and no help. Young wolf pups have no ability to keep themselves warm. So they have to snuggle up to their mother to maintain a normal, healthy body weight, excuse me, body temperature. For her to maintain a normal, adequate milk supply for eight pups, she would need a lot of food. But to hunt, she would have to leave her family, maybe for a day or two, maybe make a kill, maybe not. And if the weather had been cold back at the den, it could easily be by the time she got back, some or maybe even all the pups could have died from hypothermia. So it was an impossible situation for that mother wolf. Normally, the National Park Service does not intervene in wildlife situations, but this was different. That one wolf pack family, she and her eight pups, at that time represented 43% of all the wolves in the Yellowstone area. So they, they just could not be sacrificed. So an exception was made. Doug Smith and other biologists went out to the site of the den. They captured the mother wolf. They found the den site. And since Doug Smith is very tall, very thin, he had the job of reaching into the den. And one by one, he started to pull out pups. There had been a sighting of eight pups earlier. But after the seventh one that he pulled out, it just seemed that there weren't any more. They had a helicopter standing by. The mother was already tranquilized, ready to go. The other seven pups were ready to go. So people were telling Doug just to give up. There must only be seven. We got to go. Just leave it alone. But to Doug's credit, he just would not give up. He was convinced that there was one more in there, and he didn't want to abandon whoever that was. So he got a stick, and he started poking it in the far reaches of the den where he couldn't quite reach. And at a certain point, as he poked in this direction, there was something that he was touching that wasn't a rock, it wasn't soil, it had a little bit of give to it. So he borrowed a pair of pliers, which extended his reach. He reached in as far as he could. He closed the pliers. It was on something. And just with a little bit of force, he pulled on it. Whatever was in those pliers pulled the opposite direction, proving that there was an eighth pup. He pulled out the little guy. It was a two-week-old black male wolf pup that was struggling for all he was worth against this human, the first human he'd ever seen. And uh, the people on the scene felt that that last little pup was the one to grow up to be Wolf 21. And you'll be hearing a lot more stories about him. They flew the family back to the acclimation pen on the north side of Lamar Valley behind the Yellowstone Institute. And the plan was to keep them in the pen for about six months or so. By that time, if they would be released, the, the mother at least had a decent chance of keeping them alive. But it still would be a tough job being a single mother with a young pup. That's where our other main character comes back into the story, number eight. So he was about a year old at that point, and in human years, maybe equivalent to a teenager at 16 or 17. And he had found out by that time that his life was a lot better if he spent most of his time alone, especially away from his bigger brothers, just like a kid who's picked on and bullied all the time tends to be a loner. And that contributed to the, one of the better parts of the story. We think one day that fall of 1995, number eight was walking on the north side of Lamar Valley. He probably heard the howling from those wolves. He walked up a creek, and there would have been a moment where perhaps he came around a bend in the creek or a bend in the canyon, and he would have seen something that he'd never seen before in his life. He would be seeing wolves that were actually smaller than he was. There were two pups that were already out of the pen. So every day of eight's life, as far as we can figure, 
he was always the smallest. And now here, her pops that were even smaller than him. And we think what happened was an instinct to care for them kicked in immediately, a paternal instinct. He ran over, he befriended the pups. Soon he was playing with them, shared some food. And whether he knew it or not, he was being watched by the mother of those pups, number nine. She was desperate. She needed any kind of help that she could scrounge up. And here is apparently a guy volunteering to join her family. So that's exactly what happened. She admitted him in as her new mate, as the adoptive father of those pups. And little eight now was a big shot alpha male, something we never accepted that he would achieve. And it turned out that he became a great alpha male. I'll jump ahead about six months. I was at Sioux Creek one morning in June of 1996. We were watching eight with his family, with what were now yearlings. He was teaching them to hunt. They killed the elk calf that, that morning. They were feeding on it. They were getting ready to go back to number nine's den. That spring, she had three new pups, but now these were pups that had been sired by eight. So he had been the adopted father of those eight other pups and now the biological father of three more. But as we watched them getting ready to go back, we were aware that there was a commotion on a ridge that was sloping down toward where the family was. I looked that way and saw that it was one of the new packs in British Columbia that had been brought down a few months earlier and released. It was the Druid Peak Pack. And the alpha male in that family, 38, was not just any alpha male. He had previously, after being released, killed Eight's father. And 38 was so strong that when he was transported down from Canada in a metal cage, he tore that cage apart and they had to recapture him. So 38 was like the King Kong of wolves. I was with a group of people and I needed to prepare them for what they were about to see. I explained that if two alpha males were to fight, and there was a significant difference in the size, then the fight would be over in just a few moments with the bigger one winning, ending up in the dominant standing position, the losing defeated one on his back with his throat exposed. And that's the way that one male kills a rival male at the end of a fight, just biting into the throat. It's guaranteed to be fatal. So I had to explain to these people, if the males were to fight, that's probably what they were going to see. But then I explained that if it was smart, what he would do would be to run away. He would make an end run around 38 and the other Druid walls, circle around, get back to where number nine was with his own three pups and make his stand there. And maybe hopefully 38 and the others would be gone that time. Well, a few moments later, just as I had predicted and told to the folks there, he did start to run. But he was running directly at 38. He had decided that he was going to fight to save those pups that he had adopted. One additional problem that he had to even get to 38, he had to run up a steep ridge. So to even start the fight, he was going to run up that slope, probably be out of breath by the time the fight started. So everything was against them. Both of those males were gray, so as they crashed into each other, they rolled around on the ground together. You couldn't really tell what was happening. They were both similar color. And then finally, as I had predicted within a few moments, it was over with the dominant wolf standing with a raised tail, biting at will, the defeated wolf. But the winner was the little guy. Number eight, somehow, for the first time in his life, had won a fight. It was the most critical moment of his life. How he did it, I don't know, but he did it. So he beat up eight, he beat up 38. 38 was at his mercy. The yearlings ran up to see what their adopted father was doing. For sure, that would have included 21. I'm sure they were very impressed with what they saw. 
And what Abe did next was in a way even more surprising than winning the fight. He stepped back and he allowed 38 to go. He spared his life. He did chase him out of the territory, but he let him live. So 21 witnessed that. He was right there, probably just a few feet away. And many of you know stories about 21, how he eventually became our greatest male wolf, grew into a giant size. He was the best fighter that we've ever had. As far as we know, he was undefeated in combat and in many cases had to fight several rival males at once, still won. But despite having let, never lost a fight over the course of his long life, uh, we're pretty sure that he never killed a defeated opponent. And we think the reason was what he saw that day was what number eight did with 38. Now, another year went by after that incident. The following year was a tough year for the Rose Creek family. Number nine chose a denning spot that was um, essentially a poor location. It was somewhat near the park road. For them to get to their better hunting grounds, they had to cross the road and the flooded Lamar River. Most of the members of that family could not put up with the stress. So they helped a younger female that had a den site in an easier access area. And the only help that she had was from number eight and her most devoted son, who of course was 21. And by that time, 21 was a little bit over two years old. He was a young adult. And he had become a master hunter by that time. He um, was bigger than eight at that point as well, but was always very respectful to his adopted father. He would go out on a hunt, bring back food, share it with his mother and his pups. Oftentimes, 8 and 21 would hunt together as a team. And probably the, the most famous moment from that year involved a pup in number nine's litter who had some health problem. We never quite figured out what was wrong with him whether it was bad eyesight, bad mental development, poor physical development. But when 21 would come back with food to share with the family, all the other pups would run down with excitement to be fed. I would look uphill, and that pup didn't really seem to either understand what was going on, or if it tried to come down, it would fall over. It, would, it just really didn't seem to be able to move around normally. And then we began to notice a, a pattern in 21. After doing the hard work of going out in a hunt, making a kill, coming back, feeding his mother and the other pups, he would make a special effort to look for that last pup. And then he would trot up there and spend some time with that little guy, just kind of hanging out with him. And just think of what the emotional impact that had. It'd be almost the equivalent of a kid in a hospital being asked by Make-A-Wish what famous athlete he'd like to come and visit him uh, for that little guy to have his famous big brother uh, come and spend some time with him. So that was an example of the level of empathy that 21 had. Well, six months later, 21 had a major change in his life. It was time for him to leave home, set off on himself, and either start his own family or perhaps figure out how he could join an existing pack. And he joined 38's pack, the Druid pack. However, 38 himself had recently died. Like 21's own father, 38 had been illegally shot and killed outside the park. So when 21 left the Slough Creek area, his family's territory went east into Lamar Valley into the Druid territory, the adult females and their pups, they took one look at this big new male coming into their territory, and they were just uh, entranced by him. So those females ran over and flirted with him. The pups wanted to meet him. He played with the pups. So within about an hour or so, he was in. But he had no idea what he was getting into, the complications of being the alpha male of the Druid Peak Pack. The original alpha female, number 39, was soon to be driven out of the family by one of her adult daughters. 39 had triplets back in British Columbia. They were brought down as pups, triplet daughters. 
Forty was by far the most aggressive and dominant of the young sisters. So she drove out her mother. She eventually drove out one of her two sisters. That was 41. That made her the new alpha female, even though she was very young. And then she continued on a campaign of dominance to beat up Bully, and I think to try to drive out the last remaining sister. That was Wolf 42. Now, one of the major complications that 21 was facing in this new life he had for himself was we could see from a human perspective that he was really drawn to 42 because they had very similar personalities. It was easy for them to get along with each other, easy for them to get along with the younger members of the pack, but uh, poor 42 had to put up with all this abuse from his sister. What I saw from 21's behavior was that he seemed to have an insurmountable uh, rule or way of living, I'm not sure the exact word to say it, but he would never do anything to harm a female. Now, he certainly had the strength and the side to run over if 42 was being assaulted by his sister to intervene and physically do something to 40 but he never seemed to be able to do that. Um, he, he just seemed to be very frustrated in the situation. He appeared to be helpless in understanding what he could do to resolve it. But here's what happened. 42, it turned out, was a, a very, very intelligent wolf. So she worked out an alliance with some of the younger females in the family over the course of the next few years. And then when the moment was right, when 40 challenged 42 once more, and even we think was about to perhaps kill 42's pups, finally the two sisters had it out. This happened at night, no one saw it, but from evidence I'll mention in a moment, we figured out, we think as they fought, for sure 42 would have been losing. She just didn't have that violent streak that her sister did. But her allies, we had reason to believe they jumped in on her side, and they injured Forty so severely, by the time they let her go, she later died of blood loss. When we found Forty, she was just covered with wolf bites all over her body, more than any one wolf could have um, instilled in her. So that was the proof that it was Forty-two and her allies. What happened next was that Twenty-One was trying to figure out what he was going to do in this crisis. There were three litters of pups that year, 42, 40, and then a third female. So 21 was over at 40's den trying to figure out how he, as an adult male, could keep the pups alive who needed to be nursed. He saw 21 go over to 42's den and bring her back, hopefully to get her to help him care for those pups. They spent about an hour in the thick trees and we couldn't really see what was happening. But um, she eventually moved her pups to that central location, got the third mother to transfer her pups there. That was 42's gift. She was very, very good at organizing and managing things. So now, as far as we knew, all three litters were there. But now the question was, what would 42 do to her sister's pups after all the abuse that she had suffered from her mother, from her sister, excuse me? Would 42 kill 40's pups um, to prevent any possibility that any of them would grow up with their mother's personality? We had to make, wait months to figure out the answer to that question. An average litter of pups in Yellowstone is about maybe six or so. So we eventually saw the two surviving mother wolves walk into a small break in the trees in the forest where the pups were. And then we began to see a line of pups follow the mothers across the opening. By the time they were all on the far side, in addition to the two mothers, we had a count of 21 pups. So that was the proof that she was raising her sister's pups despite the bad blood and everything that had happened between those two sisters. So for 21, 
life was so much better now that 40 was gone. And I think many of you understand that the alpha male is not the leader of the pack. That's a, a myth. It turns out that the alpha female is the wolf in charge. It's fine if you're the alpha male, but that just means that you work for the alpha female. You work for the queen. And as I said, 42's gift was organization. So that made 21's life so much easier. All he had to do were the two primary functions of the alpha male, which I would describe this way. Number one, if your family is threatened as the alpha male, you're supposed to do something about it. Since 21 was invincible in battle, that was easy for him to deal with. Secondly, if your family is hungry, you're supposed to do something about that. Now, he was a master hunter as well. For, so for him to lead the hunts, to protect the family, those were easy jobs. And they left planning, organizing, everything else up to 42, which was his specialty. It was a perfect relationship. And as things got so much better for those adults, we watched how 21 would spend a lot of time playing with the pups. It seemed to be one of his favorite activities. And what I loved about 21 so much, with his, his great size and strength and fighting ability, what he really enjoyed doing was pretending to lose wrestling matches with the pups. So you'd see this 125-pound alpha male get in a wrestling match with maybe a, 20, a 10 or 20-pound pup. He'd wait till the little guy grabbed with his mouth maybe one of 21's legs or maybe even 21's tail. And with just the slightest pull by the, the pup, the father wolf would flop over on his back like he had just been defeated by this little guy. When he played chasing games with the pups, it would be the same way. 21 would deliberately run slow enough so the pups were sure to catch him. He would wait for the lead pup to maybe just try to grab the father's hind leg, and as soon as that happened, he would throw himself on the ground like the little guy had just tackled him. So it was like 21 was pretending that he was a pup himself, certainly pretending that he was not the alpha male. And there were times where I, I had pretty good reason to believe that uh, he had a sense of humor. He would just run around in front of the pups in circles, and then for no particular reason, just do a pratfall like a comedian, I think, just to entertain them. So it was the golden age of Yellowstone to be able to see all that. Now, 21, as the alpha male, we've already mentioned that it was his job to protect the family. And the next stage of the story was one day when their main rivals came into the valley. That was the Molly's pack from the south. They were a very large pack, very aggressive. They started to come from the southern part of Lamar Valley toward 21 and his family with a lot of pups. 42 organized getting the pups and the younger adults across the park road to the north side of the valley. That was a better position for them. And as I studied how each wolf in the family was positioned, I noticed that I did not see 21 out in front. 42 was out front organizing, leading all that. I noticed that 21 had positioned himself as the very last wolf in the line. And occasionally he would just stop, turn around, look back at the rival wolves as they were running toward 21 and his family, and just very calmly stand there, very calmly just stare at them. Not really in an aggressive way, but to me, it was just him giving him a message, you're here, my family is behind me, I'm here, don't come any closer. And it worked. They stopped. They were intimidated by what 21 was doing, the way I just described it, and they turned around and left. So that was his style. He was happy to fight. He never lost a fight, never killed an opponent. But if he could avoid a fight, that was the way that he did it. More years went by, and 21 and 42 slowly grew older. They were both born with jet black fur, but like with many married couples, they grew to look even more and more alike as they aged. They were slowly turning gray. 
eventually 42, it looked like she had a coat that was the same tone as gray flannel underwear. Um, they were inseparable. They liked to be together. By that time, the two of them were about three times older than the next oldest wolves in the family. So they spent most of their time together. Um, they were pair bonded for life. Well, the next big episode in their life involved another conflict. They had left their territory. They had gone west into the territory of the Geode Pack. They had several of the pups with them, but it was a, a small subgroup of the Druids. They ran into the Geode Wolves. The Geode Wolves charged at them. They had a fight. They had several big males in that family. 21 got between them and his family, particularly 42 and the pups. It was fighting it out and winning. Everything was going well for 21 side, as always. He was easily defeating the rivals. But then things got a little bit mixed up and complicated. It appeared that the battle was over, and many of the Druid wolves, including 21 and the younger adults, had started to walk away. Back on the battlefield, it was primarily just 21 and one of his pups. And then suddenly the geode wolves came back for another round. So I think it was maybe six geodes charged at 21 the pup. In this situation, 21's priority was to protect that pup. If he was fighting with three or four of the six wolves, the remaining combatants could kill that pup. So he had the pup run away with 21 staying behind him, always in a position between the pup and the six rival wolves. So if any wolf was to be attacked, it would be the father, not the pup. The pup was fast. It was going uh, ahead at a really good clip. It looked like this was going to work. But there were several really fast males in the geode pack. They caught up with 21. They jumped him. They pulled him down. A few moments later, all the rest of the geode wolves were on him. So um, it was a dog pile of six adult wolves, all biting 21 at will, with him on the ground trying to protect and defend himself as best as he could. And it looked like this was going to be it for 21. He was an old wolf. He wasn't as fast as he once was. Maybe his fighting ability wasn't quite at the same level that it was. And how could any wolf, even the heavyweight champion, survive an attack by six wolves? But if he was to die in the next few moments, he would die heroically because he had successfully saved that pup. In the next moment, something happened that I didn't expect. Out of the nearby trees, a whole crew of wolves started to run toward that direction. It was the other Druid adult, led by 42. This time, it was 42 that was going to rescue 21. So she led that whole contingent there. She charged at the geode wolves. They saw this incensed mother wolf coming to save her mate. They didn't want to have anything to do with that angry female. She, she and the others with them chased them away. But in all that chaos, of wolves running back and forth and trying to keep track of who is who. I lost track of where I'd last seen 21 on the ground. I thought that he was so, so severely injured that perhaps he had limped off to try to recuperate, maybe hiding in the trees or the bushes or something like that. But the longer the time passed where I didn't see him, 42 and all the others came back, I was growing more and more worried, more and more concerned. I was spending so much time searching for him that I lost track of 42, so I wanted to look at her. I found her. She was bedded. She seemed to be tranquil. She seemed to have this attitude that everything was fine. There were no issues. And then I noticed that there was another wolf nearby, about six feet away, just standing protectively beside her. And it was 21. And it was the same old 21 that I'd been watching for almost nine years at that point. 
he appeared to be unfazed, uninjured, unharmed. But what was so great about the story of that particular day was that 21 had been the hero, had been the savior, had been the decisive factor in so many battles with rival packs. Um, this was 42's day. This was the day that she was going to repay 21 for all those rescues. It also made me think of the famous Law of the Jungle of Rudyard Kipling, the one that applies to wolves. You may remember that it goes something like this. For the strength of the pack is the wolf. Now, certainly in the story of the Druids, the strength of the Druid pack was one wolf. That was 21. But there's more to that. The next line in Kipling's poem says this, but the strength of the wolf is the pack. So in that one day in 21's long career, he needed help. And the help was there in the form of the rest of the pack, the pack that he had spent so much of his life protecting and sacrificing for. Well, we're near the end of the, the story, the emotional part of the story. By this time, these two alpha wolves were getting close to their ninth birthday. And you could see that 42 was in decline, 21 was, maybe to a lesser extent. It was the start of the mating season. They got together and had some preliminary courtship behaviors. They had one more mating, maybe uh, one more of dozens and dozens over the course of their life. It got dark, I went home, and it turned out that was the last time I ever saw 42 alive. The next day, I found 21 and all the other Druids, but not her. Um, I'll explain what happened right now so that you'll understand. During the night, we figured out that the Molly's Wolves, longtime enemy of the Druids, had come in, apparently had attacked the family. We think while 21 was fighting with this section of the Molly's Wolves, a different group of Molly's went after some of the pups, and apparently 42. We eventually got the signal from her radio caller about four or five miles away. She was on mortality mode. So it turned out during the middle of the night, they apparently had caught her. They injured her. They left her. And she probably had died of blood loss. We knew where 42 was. We knew that she had died, but 21 did not. All he knew was that she was missing. So for the next few months, as I followed 21 every day and kept track of where he went, where he traveled, uh, all of his routes, I could see that there seemed to be a pattern. The Druid territory roughly runs east-west through Lamar Valley. I would see him periodically travel along the north side of the ridge of the valley, later go to the south side, go back and forth, visit all their own old or old rendezvous sites, but he never quite went quite as far as we knew where 42 remains were located. He got to within a mile or two, but never quite that far. He was approaching the um, second week of June by the time our story is, is coming to a climax. And we could see that he just was not the same old 21. He'd become even grayer. He seemed to have lost his excitement about life. There's a word in the Japanese language that I, I can't pronounce. It's beyond my ability. But the, the meaning of it is something like this in English. The reason you get up in the morning. The reason that you want to live on. And it just seemed that Whatever you want to call that, he lost it. The last time I saw him, he seemed to have lost all the energy. Uh, he was very lethargic. Some of the, his young daughters were chasing the elf. He looked up, and he, he never bothered to stand and help them. And that was just very, very much unlike 21. It got dark. I went home. The next morning, he was gone. We never saw him alive again. We eventually found out what he did the last day, the last night of his life. It's a very emotional story. His book ends with that part of his legendary life. 
but because it's so emotional, it, it literally is hard for me to talk about it in public. Plus, I don't think it's fair to destroy the emotional impact of that story uh, when you read it in the full version. So I've decided what I'm going to do is to leave that story for the book. But to compensate you for that, there is something I can do, something that I, I think will give you a special connection with 21. It's also a, a very emotional story. I don't think I've ever told it publicly here before, so this is something special for you. Several years after 21 died, I was out. It was just a normal day in the park. We had seen some of the druid walls. One of the tour guides came along with a family, parents, and a young daughter, maybe eight years old or so. Um, I always talk to the tour guides and their clients. I'm happy to tell them stories, especially about 21. The family was a very normal family. Uh, we see this all the time. They started to talk about the previous day. Uh, a couple of days they had gone on a, a backpacking trip. And I gradually realized something, that their daughter was blind. They didn't say anything about it. Uh, it didn't really seem to deter her at all. And I was very impressed by the fact that she had gone into the wilderness of uh, Yellowstone on a backpacking trip, hiking along um, with that limitation that she had. And they were going to take her to walk up to the acclimation tent where 21 spent the first six months of his life. So she had become very interested in 21's story. So I had an inspiration. I asked them to stand by for a moment. I rushed over to my car. I grabbed something. I took it out. And I asked her to hold out her hands. I placed what I had in her hands, and I told her to touch it. And here's what I gave her. It's a cast of 21's footprint. I'm not sure how well this shows up on the screen, but it's a giant paw suitable for a giant wool. So the young girl, you could see her place her fingers in this. You could see this huge smile on her face because she now was having a direct contact with 21, the most famous wolf in the world. And um, as she was experiencing that, I said, and I have one more thing to bring out. So I went back to my car. I grabbed something that was a little bit bigger, placed it in her hand, and she began to feel it. And she understood immediately what I gave her. She said, this is 21, isn't it? And I said, yes. And this is what she was holding. This is a sculpture of 21 made by a local man, George Buman. There's a life-size version. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have this smaller version. So imagine a young blind girl just touching this, feeling what 21's body was like. So all of us <laughs> were just crying as we watched her have that experience. And I'm very emotional now as I'm saying that myself. So that was the impact that 21 had on people for years and years to come. He's been gone for uh, ever since uh, um, 2004 now. But his impact on Yellowstone, impact on me, impact on all the people that knew him, people that didn't know him in person but know his stories, have seen the sculpture. Uh, that's why we love and appreciate and admire 21 so much. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Hi, Steve and Paula. And Rick. Hey. <laughs> Rick. Good to see you again, Rick. <laughs> Thank you for having me one more night. Thank you. You've got this Zoom thing down now, I see. <laughs> yeah, I was I was telling Steve that the power went out here a little while ago, so I was getting paranoid, but it came back on. We had a little bit of snow today. I just went outside to brush it off. So I'm hoping that uh, for the duration of our event, um, I'm still going to be able to communicate with you. I'm pretty far out here. It's uh, pretty close to the end of the world, but so far it's working okay. Well, I think for most people, they would say it's the most beautiful part of the world. So, um, yeah, kudos to you, and, and let's hope it lasts. Thank I'm going to turn this over to Apex to take it from here. Hey. 
So uh, just want a, a quick word for everybody. Like Rick said, he's, he's uh, brushing his satellite off the snow off his satellite right now. Uh, just did before we started. So we're hoping that we're going to get through the whole broadcast with Rick here. If for some reason he just goes dark, we're gonna he's going to call in from the phone. And uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll at least be able to ask questions and talk. So before we start with questions, and I'm sure uh, Paul is here because I can't see the TV from here with those questions coming up on Facebook. So if people have questions, type them in and um, they're going to feed them to me and I'll ask you, Rick. But before we start, um, what's got, you know, every time I've called you and we've had some wonderful conversations, there's always something new going on for you every day. So I guess my first question to you is, tell us about your day today. What did you see was as exciting? Mm -hmm. Well, like yesterday, I got up at about 4.30. I, I need to allow enough time to get ready in the morning. And then to drive out to where I, I think the wolves may be is at least 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes. Yesterday, we, we did have the junction wolves in sight at Slough Creek, which is the center of their territory. And then the Wapiti Pack, which normally is more in the central part of the park, they had come up here, but I, I only saw two members of them. So what happened today to further the story is I saw both packs of wolves. So near Tower Junction, we found the Wapiti wolves and got a count of 15 of them. And for folks that are participating that know the, the Wapiti Pack, uh, uh, their alpha female is, is probably our most famous wolf right now. She is um, white, the white female, as was her mother and her grandmother. Only about um, one female pup in every few generations has that characteristic and that genetic line. And um, in the summertime, they're seen a lot in, in, in Hayden Valley. So it's a very popular pack for people to look for. In the winter, most of the elk leave that area. So oftentimes the family comes up north. And what happened was when they howled, 15 of them, the nearby junction wolves howled back. And they were really in junction territory. So that was a problem. Now, what it made it especially interesting was we talked last evening about how the junction pack is by far our largest family of wolves. They number 34, 34 members. About half of them are pups, half are adults. But today, there are only about five of them. So it was just five wolves howling back and forth at 15. But despite the fact that uh, I'm sure the Wapiti wolves could discern that they did outnumber the other guys, they were the ones that backed off. They were a little bit unsure of themselves. And maybe they had experience in the past with Junction where they knew that Junction normally outnumbers them. So it was a smart thing to do. So that yeah, was well, my day. Yeah. That was great. I, I want to I yeah. touch on that a little bit, the pack size. So it's almost as big as the, um, the Druid pack. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, our, our normal, the stuff that we learned about wolves when we first started teaching wolves, where there's only two wolves and they're the breeding pair and stuff like that. But when you read about 21, and now I'm assuming this pack, I think you told me, had three, three pregnant females, right? And, and how, does, yeah. how does that happen in, in a pack like that? Well, I, I would say there's a lot of parallels to different possibilities in human families. So... Obviously, a, a, a human family starts with um, one couple, a man and a wife, and then have kids, um, and then more kids and more kids, and uh, maybe some cousins or, or other relatives move in. Uh, I think I mentioned last night that both of my parents were born into families that had eight kids in, in the old days. Um, what was different about the junction pack was that four adult males joined it at the same time after the previous alpha male had died, and they were unrelated to all the adult females. So that meant that there are all sorts of combinations that you can have, as opposed to in a more normal wolf pack, that all the younger wolves would be the sons and daughters of the alphas, meaning that they would all be too closely related to breed with each other. So that would encourage them to disperse to find mates that have no connection to them. 
So um, the Druid pack kind of got very complicated. That's why it got so large. And that's exactly what's happening with the, um, the Junction pack right now. Uh, the average family in Yellowstone is about 10 members. Um, and but technically a pack can be two. Uh, the biggest ever was in our records, Drew. In fact, it's the biggest ever in the world as far as we know. At least briefly, it was 38. But then they subdivided a super territory, and um, then it got back to a more normal size. So there's a lot of variation. Yeah. So we have some questions from from viewers. Uh, this one is from Susan Wydell. Susan Wydell from Wolf in Colorado is a rescue coordinator for my network. Uh, you know, you know these animals like Twenty One so well. Do you feel like there's any reciprocity in the relationship? Do they know you exist? Oh, so she said, you know, you know, 21 of these wolves so well. And she said, what is, what is the word that she, she said, is there any reciprocity with you? And then do they know you? Do they know you exist? Mm, uh, that's a very good question. Thank you for, for asking it. And it, it does come up here off and on. And this may surprise people, but I would definitely not want them to know me. So on the average, I'm probably a mile away from the walls, uh, maybe a half a mile, something like that. I've had cases where I've been off the road watching them from a distance, and I, I could see, let, let's say, one pack member unknowingly starting to move toward me. In that case, I, I would get out of there. So I don't yeah. want them to get used to me. I don't want them to get used to any people at all. They need to be wild wolves. Certainly one of the reasons for that is there is legal hunting surrounding Yellowstone National Park. So for any park wolf that is feeling comfortable with being near people, if they were to leave the park during hunting and trapping season, that could get it killed. So I, yeah. I would compare it, this may seem like a strange comparison, but it actually works, to in the modern world, unfortunately, uh, human parents have to explain to their kids the, the, uh, the principle of what we would call stranger danger, that if, if they're in the playground and adults are just walking back and forth and no one is paying attention to them, then probably everything is okay. But if they notice someone staring at them, taking pictures, moving closer, acting like they want to come up and talk to them, get out of there right away. So if you think of the range of a modern rifle, once a wolf can leave the, the park, the safest thing is to be a long ways away. And uh, you folks may know that uh, Doug Smith with his Wolf Project staff here, if there is any wolf, and generally it tends to be a younger one that, that is lingering on the road or doesn't really seem to, to have the normal um, precaution about being anywhere uh, near people, then his staff will go out there to do aversive conditioning. Um, this sounds almost like a joke, but they actually use paintball guns to give a wolf an unpleasant experience. It also marks that that's the problem one. If it gets um, worse, then the law enforcement rangers can be called in. Uh, they can kind of up the ante. Uh, they have um, special type of shells that go in a shotgun called cracker shells. They're essentially like firecrackers that make a really loud noise. They would fire it between the, the people and the wolf. It would go off. That really frightens the people. They at times actually use bean bags, things like that. So there's a lot of things that uh, the Park Service can use, but it's a real serious question, and it, it's such a tragedy. For example, about a year ago, um, some of the pups um, from that litter in Junction Butte they, they had not been able to turn them around about being comfortable walking on the road. And then early one morning when people came out, they found two of those pups run over and dead. In other words, they had learned, well, there doesn't seem to be any problem with us lingering on the road. And they just didn't understand the concept of when they saw headlights coming their way. I think they were both black wolves, so two black wolves on black payment. Uh, I, I'm sure it wasn't delivered. I'm sure it was an accident. but. Um, that was certainly a tragic situation. Yeah, that is. We, we have um, we have some more questions for you. PJ Kimball. PJ Kimball. She, she would like to know about the pictures behind them. 
She would like to know a great question about the pictures behind you on the wall. Okay, yeah. Great, thank you for asking. Um, so this is my guy, the famous World 21. Um, he was um, old at that time. He was jet black when he was born. Um, and then um, you need to here, to the, the uh, below the big picture um, is um, a vertical picture. That's him in the pan, I think at about five months old after he had been rescued. And then to the lower left is just after he had been released. So for those of you that know the story in the Wolf 8 book, uh, that was probably within a day or so, or even, a, yeah, probably within a day or so of um, number eight coming along, meeting 21 and the other pups, and starting the process of adopting them and, and joining the pack. So um, that particular shot, 21, was just about six months old. The upper one, maybe about eight or nine years old. Wow, uh, beautiful. Denise Hewitt. Denise Hewitt? She, uh, she wants to know about um, the Junction View pack. There's such a large pack, um, and the prey is not as plentiful as it was back when the druids were around. How do they sustain themselves with such a large pack? And then there's a second part to that, which is, does he think that there's a very, like, out of the junction view, is there a really uh, charismatic a leader? Or, uh, okay, so I think the question is, um, because of such a large pack, are they able to sustain themselves okay in Yellowstone? The junction, um, uh, the junction butte pack sorry um are they able to sustain themselves quite well in yellowstone is there plenty of food for them and the second part of the question was is there a like a rock star in there like a, a charismatic like alpha. a charismatic uh it's kind of like a 21 type star is yeah. there is there enough of mm -hmm. yeah. well so far they've been doing very well the proof of that was um when Jeremy, who's on Doug's staff, um, was out during the, uh, the period when the park was closed, the denning season, he counted 18 pups at the den site. And uh, the last time, um, and it was only a few days ago, we had a good um, view on account of the pups. All 18 had survived. And um, they're certainly totally healthy. They're doing great. They can travel full time with the pack. So um, there are 17 adults, and they seem to work uh, uh, together really well in terms of hunting. Um, it, it's a very well-run pack. There's a new alpha female, a, a younger one who overthrew an over one, an older one, excuse me, and she seems to really be tying everyone together. There's also a new alpha male, and our impression is that he's doing a good job. So it's kind of the next generation of leadership. In terms of, um, I guess, the, the pack member that I'm, I'm drawn to it would probably be the former alpha male. That's 1047. Um, he joined the pack with three of his male relatives uh, after the death of the previous male. And because he was the oldest of the four males, he was already dominant to them. And he served the pack very, very well. Um, he had some health problems, some injuries this year. And there seems to be a smooth transition of power to the younger guy, who probably is his cousin. The younger guy seems to be very respectful, doesn't mistreat the old guy. The old guy is certainly fully um, participating in everything. He likes to be around the pups. He's probably the, the father of many of the pups. So he's in a little bit of a semi-retirement phase right now. He's turning grayer all the time. He's a black wolf. And um, he certainly looks very distinguished. So yeah, I'm, I'm really drawn to him. And um, the, the new alpha female seems to be doing a great job. So everything is really buzzing along well for the family. Sounds a little reminiscent of, uh, of the Druids a little bit. Because um, you said he wasn't that peaceful when the other alpha female was there. Is that correct? Yeah, getting back to, to, to Junction, um, there were two older female sisters. They were both grade 907 and 969, and they fought all the time like cats and dogs. So there'd be a period where one sister would take over, then she might have an injury, the other sister would take advantage of that. And I, I, I lost count of how many times they switched back and forth. 
And I, as you know, I do a lot of talks here, and, and people are always fascinated about the sisters that don't get along. And I, I, it's always fun when I'm doing those talks, especially if there's a lot of kids in the group, with particularly with young girls, to ask um, uh, how many women in the audience have sisters, and you know most of them raise their hand. And then, of course, the payoff question is how many of you have sisters that are they're really difficult, and they all want to tell you about their difficult sisters. So I've learned a lot about sisters uh, in my wealth research. Um, so I, I think I might have mentioned last night that one of the younger females formed an alliance with an older female to overthrow the older female's sister. They successfully did that, and then the younger female turned on her ally, the other older sister, and beat her up. And so now uh, the younger sister is uh, totally ensconced in the top position, and the surviving older sister is just accepting of that. Oh, wow. So life life goes on. <laughs> yeah, right. So do we have a... So many people are so excited about his third book already. They want to know about it. Okay, so that's a great segue. Um, so many people are so excited about your third book. They want to know about it. And, and that was a question we were going to ask you anyway. So um, tell us about your third okay. book. Okay, yeah. Well, my guess is that the third book is actually going to be... Um, the most popular of the three books because of the star player, the main character. So those of you that have already read the 21 book, you've met Wolf 302, who was 21's nephew, but had a personality and a character that was totally different than his famous uncle. And um, 302's story is, is so valuable because it really shows very decisively how all male wolves, or not all male wolves, have the same character or personality. They can be very different. And there's never been two wolves that have been more different than 21 and his nephew. So th there's so much to say, but uh, 302 showed up in 21's territory, and, th and this is in the, the, the second book, got several of 21's daughters pregnant, abandoned them, and then 21 had to raise 302's pups. We, we later found through D DNA analysis that at least five of the pups that 21 raised that year had been fathered by his daughter's ex-boyfriend. Now, 302 seemed to have a little bit of a sense of responsibility, so he would walk from his family's territory one way 25 miles to the females in 21's family and visit them, maybe visit the pups, go back home, and then maybe a few weeks later come back. So I guess he had visitation rights. And um, so this won't spoil things, but at the beginning of the 302 book, which is after 21 had passed away, 21, excuse me, 302 showed up expecting that he would be the new alpha male in the Druid pack. But 21's adult son, Wolf 253, was at least, I guess you could say, the acting alpha male. So there was going to be a dispute between 302, the outsider, and 21's son. So that's how that book starts. We're, we're not sure what the title is going to be, but it's probably going to be something like The Redemption of Wolf 302 mm -hmm. with a subtitle, perhaps, uh, From Renegade to Alpha Male. So it's a very dramatic story, but uh, the point of it is, um, and this may give hope to some of us, that if um, you've had some failures and setbacks in your life, there's always time to turn things around. So I probably shouldn't give that away, but I'll give you a hint. At the very end of 21, excuse me, 302's long life story, somehow he managed to turn his life around and became a pretty good guy. So it's a... It's an exciting story. He became All a hero story. with the... So Shakespearean, you know? Um, we have more yeah. questions. Roger Squire. Uh -huh. Roger Squire. He says, this October, we had at least 60 visitors go down to the Lamar River in front of trash can pullout where the junction pups were on the other side of the river. His question is, a ranger was called, but um, nothing was done, and he's wondering... Why? Could you hear that, Rick? 
Yes, I could. Yeah. Can yeah. Thanks for asking that too. It's a, it's a good question. And it does get into a, a delicate, complicated situation in Yellowstone. Um, the people that would like to watch the wildlife in an undisturbed setting prefer, like I was explaining myself, to be far enough away so that you're not influencing their behavior, you're not changing your behavior. There is a tendency for new people when they arrive in Yellowstone to get very excited. And uh, what was happening then is if one person left the road and started to walk toward the river, it, it pretty much would be guaranteed to set up other people to do it. So I've been on the scene where that happened. And yes, at times the law enforcement rangers would come in. But the situation was that w with only a, a few rare exceptions, no one actually crossed the river. It was an effective barrier. So I, I, I'm not sure the exact distance that the wolves were um, south of the river, but uh, maybe plus or minus 400 yards, something like that. And the regulation in Yellowstone with wolves and grizzlies is that you have to be at least 100 yards from them. But there, there's an additional requirement. Uh, you cannot be so close that you're changing their behavior. So let's just say if there was a carcass and the wolf family was feeding on it and, and you stopped at 400 yards away from it, but if you saw that the wolf stopped feeding, they seemed nervous, they started to move away, they seemed uncomfortable, you're changing their behavior, so you have to back off. So I, I was not privy to the details when the rangers talked to those people, but when I was watching from a distance, that's why I'm emphasizing that in those cases, the people that were on the other side of the river from the walls and probably a good 400 yards away, and there didn't seem to be any obvious change in their behavior. So it's a delicate balance where you have to be respectful of what the regulations actually are, what the real world situation is, and then also how it's affecting other park visitors. So, um, you know, certainly a park ranger could make a, a call that, although technically there may not be any true legal harassment of the wolves, it is spoiling the experience for hundreds and hundreds of other people. So he or she, the, the ranger, may decide to ask people to come back and explain why. And when I was a park service ranger, a lot of times if you explain things well and you ask politely, people are going to be willing to, to comply. So it is a delicate situation, Bill. Yeah. yeah. I would like to know if you tell, um, tell everyone about number seven. Um, who, who would like to Number seven? Sure okay. Uh, we miss Gary out. Hoshiyama. Gary Hoshiyama would like to know if you would tell us about number oh. seven. So, so to explain okay. why these voices are coming here. I got through here. I can't see the TV, so yeah. I'm reading it to you. First of all, hey, Gary. I've known Gary since, I don't know, about 1994. So he's uh, been a great, great friend and his uh, wife, Trish. So uh, hi, Gary and Trish. Uh, thank you for all you've done for me in the walls over the years. Yeah, number seven is certainly one of our stars. Uh, I, I have a whole uh, section on her in the book about female walls. So um, she definitely was a risk taker. She was captured in Canada with her mother, number nine. And the two of them were put in the Rose Creek pan on January 12, 1995, the, the, when the wolves arrived. And because the, there was no male in the family, one of the lone males that had been captured, number 10, was put in the pen. Um, he and number nine got along to the point so well, by the time they were released, she was pregnant. And most people, I think, know the story that one of those pups, when they were born, turned out to be Wolf 21. Well, number seven had a personality and a character where she was very willing to take on a lot of risk and uncertainty in her life. So um, she was released from the pen in uh, March, of, probably about March 23rd of 1995. And instead of sticking with her mother, which was the safe and secure thing to do, even though she was only about 12 months old, maybe even 11 months old, 
in human years that might be equivalent to maybe 12, 13, 14 years old. Um, my theory is that she sensed that there was a tremendous opportunity out there for her to start her own pack. So she took off as a lone wolf, very inexperienced, somehow was able to learn how to hunt for herself well enough that she survived well. And those of you that know a little bit about Wolf 8's story, he had three brothers. One of them was Wolf 2, uh, a wolf with a jet black coat. And somewhere along the, that line, late in, um, probably late in the fall of 95, the two of them met. But probably they heard each other howling. Uh, no one saw the meeting. I, I, I've seen males and females meet each other for the first time. Initially, they're kind of wary of each other, like two dogs that don't know each other. And then they start doing play bows, wagging their tails. It was getting close to the mating season, so it was a perfect time for them to meet. They paired off. They started a new pack in the Blacktail Plateau area. It was the first naturally forming pack in the modern era in Yellowstone. And so they decided to name them after Aldo Leopold, a, uh, a biologist who was the first person to suggest that wolves be reintroduced to Yellowstone. That was all the way back in 1944. So he was way ahead of his time. And uh, for myself, that was the, the first pack I watched in Yellowstone where I saw a mother and father wolf raise new pups. So we, we had a hill that we could walk up to and, and watch the wolves from several miles away. And that was certainly one of the, the prime wolf watching experiences of my life. And it was especially um, poignant because these were first time parents. They had never raised pups before. Most young adult wolves, by the time that they have pups themselves, have been apprenticed by their own parents and have raised younger son, um, brothers and sisters in their own family. So they had to do everything by instinct and, and they were just extremely good at it. They were very playful, very affectionate with each other. So it, it couldn't have been a more ideal situation for me. And um, they eventually were the parents of uh, the famous Wolf 302. So that's another reason why they were so important. But 302 was nothing like his father. Hmm. Debbie Hinchcliffe wants to know if he's going to write a book about those. Debbie Hinchcliffe wants to know if you're going to write a book about 06. Yes, uh, if I if I didn't make it clear, I do have a contract for a fourth book, and so the uh, preliminary title is Alpha Female as the main title, and the subtitle will probably be something like Wolf 06 and other heroic Yellowstone wolves. So it will tell Osix's story. It will tell the story of her daughter, 926. And then to, to fill out um, more information, more aspects of female wolves, I'll go back over and, and tell the story of number seven, number nine, number 42. Um, another wolf that not too many people know, 870. She was one of the early alpha females of the Junction Butte pack. She was seriously injured one winter. Um, it was very difficult for her to travel with the pack. She would lag behind. We weren't even sure if she was going to survive. A younger female took over the alpha position. And um, when I went back over my notes and reviewing her story, the thing that really jumped out at me was her, her persistence and just keeping on with the family. Uh, she would have to stop and rest. She would fall way behind, but she would always catch up. She worked hard to feed and support and protect the pups born to the other female that had taken her position. But the, the, the thing that really was so poignant about her story was the loyalty of the alpha male. Even though uh, 870 was in such poor condition and um, really couldn't do too much for the family, he stayed with her, and he pretty much ignored the new alpha female. Normally, I would expect that a, uh, an existing alpha male would kind of go with the new alpha female. That seems to happen most of the time, but that didn't happen. In fact, he was actually pretty grumpy to the new alpha female and would snap at her and ignore her when she tried to 
um, to flirt with him. And then gradually, age 70, uh, recovered. And um, she never did anything aggressive against the other female. But I guess the other one finally realized what was eventually going to happen. And she just left one night and never came back. And 870 had her position back. So um, I tell that story as well. Thank you. While you're on the subject, before we have another, why don't you talk about the alpha female a little bit? I mean, you, I'm, I'm sure most people know that the alpha female is the one that rules the pack. Um, can you talk on that a little bit? And I know you told yeah, me a great I story. Think, yes, I think it was in the Wolf 8 book where I talk about how there used to be a, a definite male biologist, a uh, male bias in wolf uh, studies, because uh, in old days, it used to be almost exclusively uh, male biologists. And you know how dumb we can be. So uh, one of the stories in the Wolf Haven book, for people that haven't read it, at, I think it was at Wolf Haven, uh, a wolf sanctuary. The male wolf biologist had a teenage girl that asked to do some volunteer work because she really liked to be around wolves. So he, he just kind of gave her some things to do, one of which was to keep notes on what was happening with the main pack. And he would just review the notes just to kind of you know, give her some encouragement. And he began to be concerned about mistakes that she was making because she talked about the alpha female as running the pack. But he was a good enough scientist to rather than just fire her or you know tell her that she had really messed up, he went out and watched the pack for a while and suddenly he had a revelation that she was right and he had been wrong all along. Um, and then, so there's a lot of subtle things that uh, sometimes guys can miss because we're so impressed with size and strength and things like that. But one of the great stories about 21 that I love to, to tell because it is kind of embarrassing for 21 was um, all the Druids were sleeping one day and he wanted to go on a hunt to the east. He got up, he started to go east, he looked back over his shoulder and everyone ignored him. No one paid any attention to the big guy. So he came back, he took another nap uh, that afternoon, he tried a total of eight times to take everyone to the east. It never worked. And then 42 um, got up, and she looked around. She wanted to go west, and as soon as she did, everyone followed with 21 last in line, just shaking his head at uh, uh, what, what the real world was doing to him. So, um, And before we started, I was talking to Steve that this is really just kind of fun to, to get into, but... It, for me, trying to understand why is it these big, strong, powerful males are so willing to be dominated by the, the females. Um, I've, I've never really seen a male wolf harm a member of their family, um, you know, e even if the, the female isn't um, interested in him in the mating season or won't give him a bone. Um, they seem to be very, very respectful. Uh, my theory is that, and this is going to sound kind of strange, that Male wolves, they just have no clue where wolf pups come from or how they're made. They just don't understand the whole thing because it's two months between the mating season and the birth of pups. So what's going on with that? There's no connection that they can figure out as far as I can see. They just magically appear you know, out of the, out of the underground with the, the alpha female. So there's that famous quote from the science fiction writer Isaac Asimov that I won't be able to quote this precisely, but it's something like any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So if the aliens ever <laughs> land in, in our world and their technology is so advanced, we won't be able to tell that apart from real magic. Right. But let, let's just say if we go back to medieval times, if there's some big, strong warlord that rules over everyone, you know, it may well be that he's scared to death of the old lady that lives out in the woods because he thinks that she's a witch and she has magical powers. So, so he'll do anything that the old lady tells him to do. And that was pretty much 21's job, to do everything that 42 told him to do. <laughs> it's like my job here. Yeah, yeah. So I that's, go that's, one. that's a sign that's of your high right, knowledge. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I, I don't know if you're all aware of this, but for uh, researchers that work with dogs, they've been able to prove that the process of domestication of, of wolves to dogs has um, created
create a bit of a problem that causes dog's brains to shrink. So if you have a 100-pound dog and compare the brain size to a 100-pound wolf, the dog's brain is way smaller. And I, you know, maybe that's partly because you know, we care for them, we give them their food, you know, they don't really have to do all that much during their living. Now, um, maybe Steve, you could get on this, maybe your, your nonprofit organization could fund this. I, I'd like to compare that to what happens to human men when they get married and everything is done for them. They don't really have to make any decisions anymore, just do what they're told. Um, so, um, or did you happen to measure your brain before you got uh, uh, connected with that young lady there uh, and then see what the brain size is now? Or are there any theories on his brain size right now? <laughs> well, I, think, I think it's a sound theory, and I, I honestly okay. believe it's experience. Or, do we have some more <laughs> questions? Moving on. Yeah, like moving on. Actually, <laughs> here. We have Lynn Dribble. Dribble. She wants to know if she goes up to the Rose Creek. Anytime, just to spend some time there. Oh, uh, she she wants to know if you ever go and reminisce of the Rose Creek Pen ever. Yes, um, yeah, I do that maybe every few years. Um, it, it is a popular thing. Some of the wildlife tour guides and the park naturalists do take people up there. Doug Smith sometimes take doc documentary crews up there. But um, you know, to tell you the truth, what I do on a more regular basis is to go to where the Crystal Creek Pen site was. Uh, if people don't know, there's only one of the original seven pen sites that's still up. All the others have been taken down and removed. So uh, the only one is the Rose Creek Pack, uh, the pack where 21 and his mother were in for six months and where his parents were first in when they arrived. So the Crystal Creek Pen was taken down. There's really nothing there to see. But I, I do go up there on a regular basis and, and oftentimes take people with me. And if, if you um, have been around in Yellowstone uh, since the beginning, um, when you get up there, you can show the people with you the, the bison bones, the elk bones, the skulls, things like that, that were left behind from when the Crystal Creek wolves were in there. I, I think people know that while the wolves were in the pens for two months, the Wolf Project staff, I, I think usually about twice a week would go up there and drop off parts of roadkill, bison, elk, etc. And um, that was the way that the wolves were fed. Um, they noticed that when they would go in the pen, the wolves were still so afraid of people, which is what they wanted. They would run to the back side of the circular pen because they were trying to get away from what they felt were the enemy. So the people would drop off the meat as fast as possible and then get out of there. And we think that the wolves were kind of so frantic when they saw the people running back and forth that when they later came, found the, uh, the parts of bison and elk, they really didn't connect it with the people. It would be like if they found a dead bison in a natural environment. And uh, there's a great story, I, I think this is in the eighth book, that brings 21 back in, into the, the picture here. Mark Johnson was the park veterinarian at that time. So he was in the pen more than anyone else uh, back in those days. And he noticed that oftentimes when he would go in the pen to check the Rose Creek family, um, that was after they'd been put back after the death of number 10, meaning uh, it would be the mother wolf and the eight pups. Um, number nine in the pups, as I told you with the, the Crystal Creek wolves, they would run to the far end of the pen and they would just kind of go back and forth trying to get as far as away as they could, very, very frantic and stressed out. And But on some occasions, Mark would notice a pattern that one of the black pups, one of the eight pups, was doing something different. Um, he, and it was the male pup, would march back and forth between the people and his mother and his siblings, maybe about halfway between and it was just like he was pretending to be the acting alpha male, even though he was still a tiny little wolf. And it was like he was projecting this attitude um, where my family is behind me. I'm here. You guys are in front of me. Why don't you just stay there? 
Mark never felt that this pup was threatening him, but it was just, let's just not take this any further. Mark said right. that he remembered as he was watching this pup, that the pup was pretty much walking in the exact footprints of wolf number 10, the father of the pups, the wolf that had been illegally killed, because number 10 had done that when Mark went in to check on them as well. So that pup had never known his father, but despite that, he was acting exactly as his father had, had behaved so many months before. And when I talked to Mark about this, he knew those pups so well. Mark is an expert at being able to identify wolf pups and dog puppies as they grow and become adults. He told me that he was pretty sure that that male pup, that black male, male pup was, guess what? Wolf 21. And that of you know, exactly, exactly fit his personality and character when he grew up. So yeah. the, pup was, the pup was the father of the adults, yes. Great story. And, and just a note for people that are afraid of wolves, these guys are going into pens with meat in their hands and the wolves are still running away. So, it, you know, it, it, it always makes me laugh when people are like, you know, I don't want to get eaten by wolves at night and they're so skittish and so, so wary of people. Um, we have more questions? Yes. Um, someone was asking if, uh, if uh, Roger Squire... Roger Squire would like to know. Will 926 be included in a book? Will 926 be included in a book? Yes. Um, so she's a very important wolf. Um, 06 is by far the main character because she lived such a, a very exciting life. Um, and then um, she had many daughters. I think most of your listeners know a little bit about 06 stories, so we'll kind of maybe save that for the, the book. But uh, 926 had um, a very difficult um, situation. She was one of many daughters after the death of 06. And she had a difficult relationship with um, uh, an uncolored sister that was known as Middle Gray. 926 was black. So we had a, a brunette sister and a blonde sister that didn't get along so well. And there was a period where it looked like they were the only sons and daughters of 06 and 755, they were going to try to rejuvenate the pack at the, at, in the territory and at the den site. Um, your listeners may know that most of the other younger wolves left the park and they started a, a new family to the east. So it was kind of boiling down to 926 and her sister known as Middle Gray. And then an outsider male joined the family he was eventually known as um, 925. And I remember this one day where, because um, 926's sister was the dominant one of the sisters, then you would expect that she was going to end up with the de facto alpha male, and 926 as the subordinate one is gonna, was going to be left out of the equation. And, uh, but boy, she was not going to be accepting of that. And um, so there was this one day where there was this nice intimate moment between uh, her sister and the male, where they were walking along side by side, shoulder to shoulder, rear end to rear end, licking each other's face, both wagging their tails. And then the little sister, 926, ran over and squeezed in between them, kind of butted in and all that affection and uh, just kind of took advantage of the situation. So, and that was pretty much the beginning of the end for middle grade, that it was pretty hard to stand up to 926 like her mother. Um, if she wanted something, she was gonna get it. And so eventually uh, she became so dominant that there was nothing much that her sister could do, but just leave. So the, the brunette ended up um, victorious over the pond in the end. <clears throat> Uh, I see Paula over there going, yeah. Um. <laughs> so, um, Jean just wanted to comment. Um, she really wants everybody to get on Amazon and uh, buy his books because P is for poop is back in the number one spot. Right? Uh, did you hear that? <laughs> but for yeah, you that were yeah, uh, right. mm -hmm. well, last you night, know, there I, was I a book called. I don't mind. Yeah. 
I don't mind if Doug Smith's book outsells me or Carter's book outsells me or Dave Meech's book outsells me or, you know, any of those <laughs> great books. Um, but a cat, um, you know, that's kind yeah. of an insult. Yeah, and we <laughs> complain to Amazon, but they won't listen to us. And then, you know, the, t the title of the book, uh, yeah, and the fact that um, the cat's pooping on the cover, um, I don't know, sometimes in life you just have, you, you have to take humili humiliations and setbacks and just kind of move on. So I'm, I'm going to have to try to do that tonight. You should you should beat it by putting a wolf pooping on your cover. I mean, you can, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to stoop that low. <laughs> okay, Thanks, that's yeah. the next question. Right now there's a breaking question. Oh, there's a breaking yeah, question. So I have some questions for you. Um, okay. I want to talk about, I first read this from, from uh, Gordon Haber, who I know that you, you knew back in the day, um, yeah. talking about how wolves pass down tradition, how they learn from each other. Now, obviously, eight learned from 21, I mean, learned from eight. But, you know, and then there's this, a lot of times when there's uh, depredation, they end up killing a few wolves in the pack. Can you talk about how that's very detrimental to the pack? and how they do pass down that tradition and how they meet each other. So it's not right. really a good idea to be killing a few. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Um, I, I feel fortunate I got to know Gordon when I worked up in Denali. We were friends. And just speaking of Denali, you may know that the parks rangers up there still use dog sledding for patrols in winter. And the reason I mention that is I, I hung out at the kennel a lot, got to know the dogs and got to know the people that do the mushing up there. And uh, for some of, uh, of the folks that are listening, if they're not so familiar with it, in a dog team, you put the new dog, the young dog, in tandem with an old experienced dog. Whatever you want the young guy to, to learn, it's gonna learn way, way faster by watching and imitate an older dog do the, the job rather than a human trying to teach it. And dogs are, are, that aspect of dog learning is exactly the same that wolves do it. So it's an apprenticeship. So um, number 21 learned as an apprentice to his adopted father, number eight, how to hunt, how to be an alpha male, what it uh, means to, um, to serve the pack, serve the alpha female, raise the pups, all that stuff. And then in turn, 21 uh, carried on that tradition with uh, the younger males in his family, whereas the younger females were under an apprenticeship with the alpha female. So that's the way it works. So for example, the most difficult thing for young wolves is to get over their fear when they're out hunting large game animals. Uh, an average adult wolf is 100 pounds, meaning a younger wolf would be lighter than that. So just think of even if you are 100 pounds, chasing a 700 pound bull elk or even worse, a 2,000 pound bull bison. How are you gonna deal with something like that? So um, a young wolf will probably be very ineffectively maybe nipping at a leg or the side of an animal that's really not gonna do anything. And hopefully if the, if the animal, the young wolf is, is watchful and, and astute, it may see the, the alpha male, the alpha female do something a little bit different. Let's say the alpha female who may be the fastest wolf in the family may run as fast as she possibly can. Let's say it's an elk. She is catching up with the elk. She has to be very careful not to get kicked in the face by a hind leg. But what she's going to try to do is to lunge forward and just grab one of the hind legs. And her job is just to hang on because she's going to act as a drag, whether she's 80 pounds, 90 pounds, whatever. That's going to be a significant factor slowing down the elk. And then that will probably allow the alpha male, who because he's heavier, bulkier, isn't maybe going to be as fast as the lighter alpha female. That's going to give him a chance to play his part on the team where let's say he'll run past the side of the elk, past the female wolf, get in front of the elk, which is a very dangerous position to be. If it's a bull, the bull can use his antlers to stab and kill the, the uh, male wolf, can trample the wolf. There's a lot of ways that a wolf can do really, get, can have serious damage done to them by an elk. 
But what the male is going to try to do when the moment is right is to leap in the air. He's going to be totally off the ground and he's aiming for the throat and he's going to try to grab it like this. So that means turning his head sideways. And if he gets a grip on the throat like this, it'd be like some really strong NFL player just grabbing one of us like this and squeezing. You're going to be asphyxiated. So just picture the, the male wolf grabbing it like that. They have about a thousand pounds of pressure they can observe. So they're not only doing that, but their canine teeth are probably puncturing the throat as well. So there's two ways that a wolf in that situation can actually kill the elk, either by asphyxiation after a couple of minutes of not being able to breathe, or the elk is going to collapse, or it may be that the canine is going to puncture the jugular vein and uh, there'll be tremendous blood loss. So all those things are hard enough, but in addition to all of that, an experienced elk is gonna try swinging the wolf back and forth with his head like that. If there's a nearby tree, they're gonna try to smash the wolf into it. So it's a very, very dangerous process. Many wolves have been killed by elk. So um, there's just a lot to it. But imagine how impressed you would be if you were a yearling male or female, you saw your mother do her part, you saw her father, your father do that part, um, and you'd be learning the whole time. So you're finally figuring out, okay, that's the way to do it. So yeah. part of your question yeah. was, let, let's say if you have a, a deal, whatever the details, the adult wolves uh, are killed by people, and there's only young, inexperienced uh, wolves that are left, how do you learn that? It's by trial and error. So um, that means that uh, they'd fail a lot. And if they're not eating, if they're starving, then that can certainly lead to a far, far worse situation where if there's a ranch or a farm in the area and there's some livestock that maybe aren't being watched over too well and the wolves can get access, then they, they may try their luck with those animals. And compared to wild animals that can defend themselves so effectively, most domestic animals probably are not going to be able to, so they're going to be an easy kill. And once they figure out how to make easy kills, it may be hard to break them from that process. So it, it's a critical thing, that apprenticeship. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? We do. Kathy Miller would like to know why Dave's Hill is called Dave's Hill. She wants to know who is Dave. Kathy Miller would like to know why Dave Hill is Dave, called Dave's Hill. Dave Hill? He's Dave's called... Hill. Oh. Dave's Hill. Is Dave's Hill called Dave's Hill? Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. No, yeah, uh, it comes up all the time. So we have a lot of areas in the in the park where we just have informal names. There's Dave Dave's Hill, Bob's Knob, Dorothy's Knoll, things like that. And um, Bob's Knob is named after Bob Landis because he generally walks out there every morning with his fancy camera equipment to see if anything is going on. So so we uh, honored him by calling him that. Dave, my understanding, was a coyote researcher in the years just before the wolves came along. And so that study, um, they had uh, many graduate students that were in Yellowstone for some time, and they studied the coyotes like we study the wolves right now. So they would find observation points where they could watch dens and stuff like that. And apparently he, Dave, was the guy that stayed up there most of the time. And then Dorothy was a coyote researcher that um, um, that's actually a parking lot um, in Lamar Valley. So it's named after her. So um, that's where that comes from. Yeah. By the way, one more thing on uh, young wolves that I, I, is kind of fun to add. Uh, wolf researchers have a term that I'll explain, and it's called prey search image. So... What that means is when you're in the early days of your apprenticeship, you're watching and learning from the older wolves, and elk is really the, the primary prey of, of wolves here. So they learn, okay, we see these bison, but most of the time the older wolves bypass them because they're so big and strong, but they seem to really perk up and really try when they see elk. So that seems to be what we're supposed to hunt. That's our search image. So when they're on their own, um, they're, they really get way more interested if they see um, a, uh, an elk. Um, whereas if um, 
let's say if a wolf left Yellowstone and went on a ranch and started to see cattle, which had never been seen before, well, maybe to a, a true wild wolf, cattle seem a little bit like bison. And the young mm-hmm. inexperienced wolf mm-hmm. might mistakenly think, well, these things are really tough. You can't kill them. You know, they're going to kill me, so I'm going to avoid them. So that's the explanation of how, in many cases, people will see young wolves pass through some livestock and have no interest in them because to them it doesn't match it. In my case, when I was a kid, my prey search image would be things like hamburgers and hot dogs and things like that, but definitely not broccoli and and peas or carrots and stuff like that. So it's still hard for me to eat those things. But what, I want to ask you one question. Do you have a place named after you yet? Like Rick's Hill or Rick's Creek? Yeah, or... there is. Um, yeah, uh, I think it's called Rick's Hill, Rick's Knob or something like that. It's uh, near Tower. It's a little bit, um, if you're, people are familiar with the road that goes uphill, just a little bit west of, of Tower, it's kind of the first place where you can pull off. I think that's called Rick's Hill. So, yeah, I guess I have something, yeah. There you go. Good, good. Do we have I don't I don't seek it out though. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay will say, um, have you ever seen people opposed to wolves turn into enthusiasts? Have you ever seen people oh opposed to wolves turn into enthusiasts? Yes. Yeah. Point. Um yeah, and that's kind of the best part of being here. Um oh, there's so many stories to tell, but um I, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I think they're okay with me telling the story, but uh, I'll leave their names out just in case. They're really, really great people. So um, I'm just going to call the man Joe, and he grew up in a rural area. And what was very normal in in his area uh, for young boys um, to learn how to trap, and so he became a master trapper, and he would catch muskrat, coyotes, and things like that. When he grew up, he he liked to spend his days off uh, hunting coyotes and had a lot of dogs that he would use and tracking them down. So he became um, a very proficient uh, um, coyote hunter. And that's what he liked. He liked being outdoors. He liked doing that. And his wife, um, they had a great relationship, and she kind of had an opposite view of life and animals, and so she was never really comfortable about that, but she tried to be understanding about what her husband was like. And uh, I'm not sure how this happened, but somehow they decided to come to Yellowstone. They, they heard about the wolves here. They arrived, I, I think, pretty much the first year. And the husband, uh, due to all his years of, of looking for coyotes for his hunting purposes, um, pretty much right away became pretty much our best wolf spotter. Uh, and he still is. Um, he would just arrive in a lot and just gradually uh, pick his binoculars up and look like this. And he said, well, they're right over there. And I've been looking for him for two hours and hadn't found him yet. So all those skills really were helpful to us. And uh, very quickly what happened was um, he totally changed. He um, stopped hunting coyotes. He, he gave away all of his dogs. And um, every time he and his wife have time off. Um, they drive from their home state um, to here, and um, they get to do this activity uh, together day after day, week after week, uh, time after time. So it's brought them together. Um, uh, so it's this great story, and, and there's others like it here. That That's the irony that men that arrive here that have had a hunting background um, oftentimes beca- become our best spotters and in the long run, some of our best advocates for wolves. So it's a great thing to see. Yeah, I've known of quite a few hunters converted to for his sake because it's the same skill set. You've still got to sneak up on an animal if you're a wildlife photographer without them seeing you, which is taking pictures of them. And so, yeah, I know a few people like that that stopped doing it. But, um, Cabrea, uh, Kilo would like to know. Cabrea, Kilo, Kilo. He would like to know how he balances out his writing with his wolf watching. Oh, that's a good question. How do you balance out your writing with your wolf watching? Well, I've had to adjust. So um, for many years, um, let's see, um, 
I finished up with the Park Service at the end of February of 2018. And um, so I can kind of, I, for a while, I continue with what, which was my normal pattern. I'd wake up early, go out for the morning session of studying the walls. And then for people that haven't been here, what's normal year round is in the midday hours, the, the wolves tend to rest and they're inactive. So they'll sleep for three, four hours during the middle of the day. That that's pretty much happens most days. So, um, you can stick, you can stick around all day. You can take a nap yourself. You can work in other things, but, um, generally they're not going to do too much. So I, I, my cabin where I am now is about, um, a 20 to 30 minute drive from where the wolves are likely to be. So I'll come home. Um, I don't get enough sleep at night. It might only be about four hours or so. So I try to catch up by like the wolves napping in the midday hours, kind of like dogs do too, I guess, now that I think of it. And then uh, go back out for the evening hours. So by the time I'm getting back out there, the wolves are about waking up and getting ready to do something. They're about to rally. And so um, there's also time in the afternoon when I'm home to to transcribe my field notes. So I work on that or uh, like little project reports I have to do, things like that. But I, I gradually switched over to uh, just normally going out in the mornings now. So that's just to kind of keep up with what the wolves are doing. And then I come back, also rest a little bit. And then um, on some days concentrate on uh, catching up with my notes, but most days work on the, the writing projects. For people that have, have worked on books, they know that once you have your first draft done, that's only the very, very beginning of a long process where you write a lot of drafts. I have a great editor, her name is Jane, and we work very well together. So she certainly uh, does huge things to make my books more readable to the general people, to make it more understandable. So we work well together. We finished the 302 book, except for the cover design but it won't be out until September or so. And then um, I, I guess the 06 book, if everything is the, on the same schedule, it would be the, the, the next fall. So 302 would be the fall of 21 in September, and then after that, the, the 06 book. And then we're thinking after that of maybe uh, taking some of the stories in the books and making them into um, versions for kids. So that might be next. And then maybe movies, things like that. So. Um, you may know that before my books, um, there was a, um, a book by uh, Nate Blakesley about the 06 female um, called American Wolf. It's been a big bestseller. Leonardo DiCaprio bought the rights to that book to turn it into a movie. And for those of you that have read it, uh, for better or worse, I'm, I'm kind of a, a character in it. He interviewed me a lot about the story of 06. So we don't know if they make it, if Leonardo will play me or will play Doug Smith or something like that. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. That was going to be my question. That was, that's a segue to a quick question. I was going to say, if they do make the book, um, who would you want to play you? Well, my preference <laughs> would be not to have me, just to have it Walls. Yeah, my preference, if it's based on one of my books, would be um, that they use this really sophisticated um, CGI for, for wolf characters. So for those of you that saw the live action Disney uh, recent um, Jungle Book movie, those wolves look very good to me. And uh, that's what you have to do. Um, wolves in captivity, as far as I know, and I, I've been around uh, trainers that work in movies, um, it's very limited what you can get wolf-looking animals to do on screen. Um, and so th there just would be no way that you could get them to do what you would need to do to tell the story. Um, so you'd have to do that. Now, that used to be very expensive, but they perfected the technology. And I'd like to think that maybe now it's perfected, their cost comes down. There has been some interest in, in Hollywood people in the book, so we'll see. Um, I watched the recent Disney version of The Call of the Wild with Harrison Ford, and that was very well done, too. Now, I think the wolf and the dog characters, though, in that film, I, I think they deliberately made a choice to, to have them just slightly 
less than perfect, a little bit more of a caricature, uh, because they, they kind of needed some of the characters to be a bit funny. And um, so, you know, that was okay for that movie. But as I say, I, I think they could really do very realistic CGI walls. So that would be my preference. And, and my recommendation would be to have no human characters in it. It just would be their story, which would probably require you to have a narrator, which I, I think would, would work well. So you just did a really good political move that you completely avoided my question about you. <laughs> yeah, so, you yeah turned... that would mean that no one would play me. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I ran into a bunch of actors over the years, uh, Matthew McConaughey, um, let's see, um, yeah, a bunch of people over the years. So I don't know, I, anyone, I guess, yeah. I, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not very fussy. Yeah, Harrison Ford would be pretty good. Huh? Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Some Indiana Jones. <laughs> Indiana Jones. <laughs> What's the next so, question? Uh, well, I also wanted to know, um, just quickly, are you still on your book watching Record Street? Oh, um, the, the, same, same, uh, she wants to know if you are still on your Wolf Record watching streak. Yeah, well, um, yeah, we've had some interesting questions. Um, I, uh, for better or worse, I went out for every day um, early. Uh, I reached the 15 year point. And um, by that time, I was kind of thinking it, this is going to end sometime, some way. And I, I wanted to end, it to end in a way that wouldn't be my fault. Like I didn't want to just give up. So I just kept on going. But um, I, I kind of felt that um, I had kind of proved my point, I guess. <laughs> and uh, But I, I had no idea what was about to come my way. And um, I, I don't really talk about this too much, but I, I started to be concerned that I was getting shortness of breath when I was trying to walk uphill in places that I'd walked up a thousand times before. And I'm, I'm, I'm very quick to to get tested if I feel that something isn't quite right. My father died of a heart attack when he was 52. So to make a long story short, I, I needed a um, open heart surgery. I had some blockages. And um, I felt that that was an appropriate way to finish up that streak. So my good friend, Lori Lyman, she drove me to the hospital in um, Billings, they got me set up, and um, uh, it went perfectly. I had no problems, um, no issues at all. I accepted the fact that I was going to be, have to be in the hospital for a certain number of days. I did everything all the medical people told me to do. I was very thankful to them. They wanted me to, after I was released, they wanted me to stay in the city a while because if there were any complications being way out in the remote area, it could be difficult getting me to help in time. So I, I agreed that the smart thing to do was to spend a few more days there. But the, the story I'd like to tell is when I was still in the hospital room, I had a window, it was, I had a, a room to myself, the, the windows faced the, the north side of the city of Billings. Billings really isn't that big of a city, it, although it's the biggest one in the state. And um, so obviously I could see buildings, uh, et cetera. I could see cars and traffic and stuff, but I could also see cliffs and fields and, and wild areas just on the north side of town. So I oftentimes would just look out the window as a normal thing to do. And then I fell into this pattern where every time I fell asleep, I had the same reoccurring dream. And it was one of the, it, it's the type of dream where you know you're dreaming while you're in the middle of the dream. And that made it even yeah. more interesting. In the dream, I was in the Billings Hospital, in that room, getting out of bed, looking out the window to the north, seeing exactly the same things that I would see when I was awake, except for one thing. When I looked out there, 926 family, 920, uh, the Lamar Canyon Pack, was looking back at me through the window. Every time I went to, to sleep, I had that same dream. Uh, and again, I, I knew this wasn't reality. I knew that 926 and her brood weren't in Billings, Montana, on the outskirts of the city. 
but I had plenty of time. So uh, the effect that that had on me was just uh, this great motivation to, uh, once again, to do everything the doctors, the nurses, the cleaning lady told me to do because I wanted to get back to Lamar Valley. And so I was a, a good patient, maybe the patient of the year. And then a friend drove me back to my house. Um, I had the complication that they wouldn't let me drive for a month. So I had to arrange for friends to drive me, which when you're a guy, that's kind of a hard thing to accept, but I had to accept it. So a, a friend of mine, Darlene, was, was willing to come over. She helped me uh, in the front seat. Uh, we drove out to Lamar Valley. We parked. I, I looked out from the road, and there was 926 in her family. And so no pretty much the first thing I saw when I was back was her family. So that's my story. There's no getting out. They're going to pull you back in. Um, yeah, yeah they're any more? back in. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I think we, we, it's, it's, it's almost uh, 8 o'clock your time, 7 o'clock our time. I want to just ask one more question, um, and it was actually, uh, uh, which one was it? Uh, I had a really great question I wanted to, oh, yes, I want to talk about um, the humanities. We've talked a lot about stories, and when you and I talk, um, or have talked over the last year or so, we talk about a lot of things. We talk about connection, we talk about performance, we talk about magic. We talk about all kinds of things, and, and the way that you advocate, you know, we talked a little bit today when the Zoom call started, it, you telling stories is an incredibly special way to advocate. There's a science part of it, and then there's this connection. And, and when Paula was at uh, the Wolf um, Symposium last year, someone spoke about that. They said, unless you can connect the humanities to the science, a lot of people are not going to listen. So can you touch a little bit on that? Because you are a master storyteller, and you're naturally good, but you I know from talking to you that you also watch a lot of people and how they connect. And the way that you bring the wolves' lives into other people's lives is incredibly important. So, And I know it means a lot to you, so you can touch on that a little bit. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. It, it, it's really an appropriate way to maybe finish up here. And I'll, I'll try to see if I can condense uh, some thoughts that I have in this. Um, first of all, there's a very important role and a great need for wolf advocates that are capable of, of um, counteracting the false arguments that the anti-wolf people have. That's it's very much needed, very critical, especially when false information is presented about wolves. Um, so having said that, um, there's another thing to say that it, it almost never happens if two people have opposing point of views that one person is going to argue their point or present their evidence in such a way that they're going to convert the other person. It, it just isn't going to work because the, they've actually done studies where they've been able to prove that if you're having that sort of, I'll call it an argument, you're actually digging yourself deeper into your own belief. Not only are you not listening to the other person, but you're convincing yourself that you're even more right than you thought you were, and the opposition is, is even more stupid than you thought they were. So um, it, it does some good if you're speaking to people that have a degree of an open mind. Let's say someone writes an anti-wolf letter to a, a newspaper and someone responds to it, and that hopefully will be effective in people that are willing to consider both sides. So that's why I say it's neutral. But just talking to someone that's really set in their ways, you're probably not going to make any any progress unless you do something different, which is to find a way to put all that aside and to be friendly with the, the person. Um, you maybe ask them a little bit about their family, their background, kind of get off the subject a little bit and then maybe casually say, oh, you know, you might be interested because I know you're a hunter in this hunt that I saw these wolves the other day. And maybe talk about how seeing, you saw a wolf got trampled and then get up but still fought to the death with uh, the deer and managed to finish it off. You know, tell a story that you think would relate to the person. So uh, I have a lot of respect for people that are ethical hunters 
And I, I think of all people in, in different types of categories, they really should um, have great respect for wolves because they're fellow hunters. Um, Native Americans oftentimes will call wolves brothers in the hunt, and that was their attitude. So that's the way that I approach it is just to tell stories. And um, a, a way that uh, this is going to sound like a strange comparison, but one of the most effective stories that was ever told, this doesn't have anything to do with wolves, but you'll see the point. Back before the Civil War, when there was an abolitionist movement in our country, where the intellectual class was desperate to convince our country to end slavery. I'm from Massachusetts, and I, I grew up near Concord, meaning that's where what, people like Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau lived out their lives and had their careers. And you may know that they were among the, the top abolitionists in the country in the 1850s. And if you went to a lecture given by Emerson or Thoreau, um, there'd be no way that anyone could, could beat the arguments and the logic that they would have for ending slavery. It, it would be virtually perfect in terms of being intellectually strong. But even they made very little progress. But then there was another person who took it in a very different way. Um, it was a woman. And what she did, as I understand it, she interviewed former slaves and current slaves and just asked them what their lives were like and started to recall the horror stories of what some of them had been through. She took that research, she wrote a novel, she fictionalized it, and of course that was Uncle Tom's Cabin. And that was what changed America. It wasn't the intellectuals. It wasn't the logical arguments. It was those stories that were based on real people. And that's what I try to do. So I don't tell people you should believe this, you should have this attitude toward wolves, you shouldn't do that. I just tell stories. And um, I feel, yeah, that's the way to go. Yeah, that's 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 what I our think nation so. is like. Yeah. I, think I, so. I just yeah. wrote something. I, um, I, cannot, I, I don't want to mention which wolf it, it, it was, but it was one of our most famous wolves who died and people were just so heartbroken over the animal's death as I was. But then I, I thought of a way to, um, to talk about the wolf, to tell, tell the story. It's in, our, it's in one of my books. And I, I came up with this thought, as long as we keep on telling someone's story, they never truly leave us. You know, whether it's a wolf, whether it's a pet, whether it's a family member, uh, whatever. So that's all I'm trying to do is just to tell their stories and then let them land as they will with people. And you do it so wonderfully. You touch everybody's hearts. I know when I read your books, and I usually listen to them on audio book while I'm in the car, and I've listened to each of them twice. I, there's certain points that just get me every single time because you tell it so beautifully and you understand them so well. So, so honored to be sitting here with you tonight. I hope we chat again soon. Thank you for being here at Sedona Wolf Week, Rick. We really okay. appreciate it. Okay. So, thank you, everybody. Thanks for attending. <laughs> Good night.